The Torah portion this week is Nasa, which actually means to take up or lift up. And that's where the term, many of you will notice that sounds familiar, but that's where Nasa got its name from. I thought it was kind of interesting, so it must have been a Hebrew that uh, gave that name. So um, anyway, we're going to go into an overview. This week, the Torah portion is Numbers 421 through 789, and the Prophets, Judges 13, 2 through 5. So Nasa is um, those particular verses. We're going to be going back and forth quite a bit. And so you're, we're going to have a lot of scripture, but a lot of meat. So just just hang on. Is it okay if we go clear through Oneg? Yeah. <laughs> I just want to see how hungry we are for the Word of God compared to how hungry we are for, for the, the food that's in the cafe. Okay, so the overview... Oh, what did I not turn it on? It always helps when you turn this thing on, I've noticed. I'm not really a technical genius, but on and off I get. Okay, the Gershon Levites is covered in Numbers 422 through 28. And the Gershonites from the ages of 30 to 50 years old were assigned the duties of caring for all the hangings, the curtains, the animal skins, all these things that it were of the tabernacle. And actually, their duties were under the authority of Ithamar, the younger brother of Eleazar, in the body of Yeshua. Today, the Gershonites can represent intercessors and prayer warriors who meditate the true covering of Yahweh's word, full of life and giving principles to his people. Now, one of the things you're going to notice today it's like we noticed last week. Everyone has a job to do in the temple service. All of the Levites had assignments. They had jobs to do, much as we do today in the body of Messiah. We have jobs. We have assignments. We should have. You know, this isn't like, a, you know, Sunday night quarterbacking. You know, we're not the kind of people that just sit on the sidelines and watch the game, right? We all should be in the game. Amen? If we want to be the bride of Messiah, we have to be in the game. It's not a sideline sport. It's not a spectator sport. This is real life. It's real, um, it's real redemptive work that he's called us to do. Okay, so let's go on to the Marari. Did I say that right? Shocking. The Marari Levites. Each Marari was assigned a duty of handling and caring for the framework of the tabernacle, including crossbars, posts, bases, and everything related to their work. Marari were, were responsible for the foundation of the tabernacle. Okay, now today, in the body of Messiah, we have people today that are God has called to be those that lay the foundation, to be the pillars, to make sure that everything is run in order. Today there are those whose main focus is laying a good foundation also in the hearts of believers, which is a, one of the most important works, I believe. These foundation workers are the ones concerned for the redemption of the soul. Like the framework of the tabernacle, these modern-day Marites are also hidden in the body of Yeshua and not often in the lamb, limelight. None, I almost said lamb light. It's kind of good, though. I kind of like that. Maybe I should have said lamb light. Um, <laughs> nevertheless, without the framework, the tabernacle would not exist. So this is going back to what Paul was saying, that we are all members of the body, and if one member suffers, we all suffer. We're in this together. We're a community. We're, we are the body of Messiah. That's what we're called to be, and each of us has something that we're called to do. Moses, and in uh, Numbers 4, 34 through 49, Moses, Aaron, and the leaders of the community counted the Levites, age 30 to 50 years, 
who came to serve in the tabernacle. The Kohas numbered 2,750, the Gershons 2,630, and the tribe of Merari 3,200. And verse 49 actually says that Yahweh's command through Moses, each was assigned his work and told what to carry. That is as it should be in the body of Messiah today. We should have assignments. We should have you know, things that we're responsible to do. Think how much better things would be if everyone did their part. Now, I'm not saying this to lay, if you're not doing anything right now, I'm not saying this to lay a guilt trip on you or anything. I'm just saying, you know, be prayerfully considering what is it, Father, that you want me to do? What is my part in the body? What is it that you have called me to? Because God gives assignments to all of us. Many believers have various backgrounds. So we all came from all these different ways of believing, ways of doing things, much like when two people get married. You know, they come together with two totally different families, two ways of looking at things, two ways of doing things. And I don't know about you, but in marriage, you know, it's been my experience, does everything always run harmoniously? Yeah, okay. We will cast out that spirit of deceit over Sarah. (laughs) We have to work through things, don't we? We're a family, and we're going to have issues come up that we're going to need to work through. We don't, it's not about being able to take our toys and go home. That's not what relationship should be. And relationship, I don't care who, who it is, or it's work. It's work. We're going to have people that irritate the snot out of us. And they might be sitting next to you right now. But we're called to love. And we're called to work harmoniously together. So we have to figure out how to do that. Okay? And so it's not always going to be easier or easy. When believers move toward the study of Torah, we have realized that we've entered into a very organized lifestyle that lines up with Yeshua's heavenly pattern. How many of you have found that out? I have. And you know what is difficult for someone like me who's used to flying by the seat of their pants to have order? It's like, what meaneth this? You know, it doesn't come natural to some of us. Some people, it comes very natural to, you know, everything in order, everything in its place, every, you know, doom, 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 doom. But... To most of us, or, well, I shouldn't say most of us, but some of us, that's not the case. So as we begin to walk in this heavenly order, we find that his word and all of his appointed times move as a single unit in unison. In in other words, we are in like step. We know how to celebrate. Do, Do we know how to celebrate? Man, we all have that down. I, that was my favorite thing to learn how to do in this Hebrew walk, because I love to have fun. And so, man, with all these festivals and all these things going on all the time, it's like, woohoo, one big party. But the walking in unison part is not always the easy part. So when we choose to observe and live Yeshua's word, which contains his Sabbaths and feast days, his spirit or his Ruach engages with us and orchestrates us, at least it should, into moving together as one, transforming us into a mighty army for Yahweh. That's what Torah does. It gives us a framework to live within. It gives us guidelines, and it's anything but bondage. 
It's anything but bondage at all. If you have, you know, Torah is considered a fence. So let's just go there for a second. If you have a fence surrounding your property and you have little kids, and what does that fence do? Protects them. It keeps them from wandering off too far. It keeps them from getting lost. It keeps them from getting hit in the road by an automobile or a truck or a semi or something like that, right? Now, how many kids, there might, there's probably a few, come to think of it, that are going to tell you this is bondage? You know? As they get older, they're going to look at it as bondage, Right? because they no longer need that fence. They're able to go beyond the fence. With Torah, it's a little bit different. We're never able to go beyond the fence. <laughs> we need God's protection. We need to know how far we can go. Now, I've never served in the military, but I've talked to people that have and have a lot of family members that served in the military. And there was a thing called, they've told me, that's called the demil demilitarized zone, where you know how far you can go, where there's no mines, there's no, you know, danger, the enemies are far off. And so they kind of map that out and figure out how far it's safe to go. You know, that's kind of what the Torah is. God has, can tell us how far we can go where it's safe to go, and where it's not safe, so that the enemy is unable to blow us up, right? Okay. What, what we're going to cover today are a couple of things. Purity of the camp, which is covered in Numbers 5, 1 through 4. Cleaning the camp, the law of jealousy, and the law of jealousy, which is in Numbers 5.11 through 31. And the Nazarite, which is in Numbers 6, 1 through 21. I don't know if we'll get to the Nazarite part yet, but we will try. Okay? We will do our best. So let's first go to Numbers 5, 5 through 10. How many of you are excited to live by Torah? Yeah. Woo I'm going to ask you this at the end of today's message, and hopefully we'll see as many hands. Okay. <laughs> Numbers 5, 5 through 10. When a man or woman wrongs another person in any way and so is unfaithful to Yahweh, I underlined that, because we don't think of wronging each other or doing something against another human being as being unfaithful to Yahweh. But that only shows how far we are from Torah. We think we're observant, but we really don't understand some of the key points here. That person is guilty and must confess the sin he or she has committed. They must make full restitution for his wrong and add one-fifth to it and give it all to the person who is wronged. But if that person has no close relative to which restitution can be made for the wrong, in other words, if that person that you wronged happens to be dead, you know, then, you know, it requires restitution anyway. So if you have cheated somebody, maybe in a real estate deal or some kind of thing, um, and the person that you cheated is dead, you still need to go make restitution to their nearest relative. But if that person has no close relative to which restitution can be made for the wrong, the restitution belongs to Yahweh and must be given to the priest, along with the ram with which atonement is made for him. All the sacred contributions the Israelites bring to a priest will belong to him. Each man's sacred gifts are his own, but what he gives to the priest will belong to the priest. Now I'm going to go into something a little bit. I'm going to go over to Leviticus. Oops, did I go too far? I've gone too far. Okay. I'm going to go over to Leviticus, the 19th chapter and verse 16. 
You shall not go about as a talebearer among your people, nor shall you take a stand against the life of your neighbor. I am Yahweh. You shall not hate your brother in your heart. You shall surely rebuke your neighbor and not bear sin because of him. And you shall not take vengeance nor bear any grudge against the children of your people, but you shall love your neighbor as yourself. I am Yahweh. And the reason I went to this Leviticus scripture is because most, mostly in the body of Messiah today, not too many people are cheating people out of money. The major problem, and I'm just going to ask if you agree with me, is Lashon Hara, which is the evil tongue. We sin with our mouths toward our brothers. We murder our brothers with our mouths. Well, can I ask if you agree with that? Okay. I don't think, I'd, I haven't in my years of ministry known very many people that actually cheated someone out of something. It's been a few, but, it's, but this, poof, it's rampant. It's rampant, and, and that's what we're going to deal with today. Because Yeshua dealt with it. He didn't let it just go. But he gave it a, us a prescribed way of dealing with it. In Matthew 5, 23 through 26, it says, he says, Therefore, if you bring your gift to the altar, and there remember that your brother has something against you, leave your gift there before the altar and go your way. First be reconciled to your brother, and then come and offer your gift. Agree with your adversary quickly while you are on the way with him, lest your adversary deliver you to the judge, the judge hand you over to the officer, and you be thrown into prison. Assuredly, I say to you, you will by no means get out of there till you have paid the last penny." Now here he's probably speaking more about someone cheating their neighbor. You know, there were scales with, you know, where they weighed their coins and money, and it was real easy to cheat someone that way, right? But I believe there's a spirit underlying what he was speaking here. And the spirit is saying that if you don't make restitution with your brother, then we have a judge. We may not be got we may not go into a court of law, but we do have a judge that we will stand before one day and give an account for everything that we've done, good or bad, right? Not offering closure, and I'm speaking as a counselor here, but if someone comes to you and says, I know you're offended at me. Because remember, he says, that if, if you know that your brother has an offense against you, you go to your brother. It's not that you're offended at your brother when you're at the altar. He's addressing here someone who's offended at you. So what you do is you go to that person and you say, I know you're offended at me. I did this and this. I'm so sorry. Will you forgive me? When a person does not do that, and the other person holds forgiveness back and holds closure back for that individual, it is a form of manipulative control. Do you see that? Even if the neighbor does not feel he has unforgiveness towards an individual and feels warranted in putting that person on hold until some time in the future, it still does not make it a right action before the eyes of Yahweh. Withholding spiritual release is a form of judgment that degrades an individual. Do you agree? If you're asking someone for forgiveness and they withhold forgiveness from you, is it humiliating? And you feel like you're still carrying judgment for it. I, I just, I'm, I'm going kind of slow here because I want us to really get this. It's so important because this is where the rubber meets the road, whether we like it or not. It's not the yahoo, hallelujah kind of thing that we all jump up and down and go, yee-hee, you know. 
It's the reflection kind of thing that we need to understand because this is what most of us deal with on a day-to-day -day basis, no matter who it is we're dealing with. Now, if he does not offer forgiveness quickly, his own sin will not be forgiven him, and then he is the defiled one. He has spiritually bound himself. His sin will remain on him, but the person offering the olive leaf of forget, you know, asking for forgiveness is the one who will be set free. Gives, gives room for thought. Amen? Notice what Luke 17, 3 and 4 says. Take heed to yourselves. If your brother sins against you, rebuke him. Now you notice he does say correct him. If your brother is sinning against you, you need to call him on it. You know why? Because that's love. If, if you have a brother when you're growing up and he keeps taking your car and running all the gas out of it, just using a, an example, are you not going to say something to him? Are you not going to correct him and let him know his behavior is unacceptable and is causing an offense in your heart? We should. And I know this is going to sound really strange coming from a therapist, but you know what most of us hate more than anything, including me? I would rather bite a tiger in the butt than have to go confront somebody about something. Hate it, hate it, hate it. But sometimes it's necessary because of the love of Yahweh. Because God does not want you carrying an offense and being defiled, and he doesn't want your brother carrying an offense and being defiled. Notice what it says. Rebuke him, and if he repents, forgive him. There's kind of a clause there that your brother needs to repent, He's accountable. If you rebuke your brother for something, he should have, you know, in line with Scripture, then he needs, to, he needs to repent if he's done wrong to you. And if he does, and if he sins against you seven times in a day and seven times in a day returns to you saying, 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 I repent, you shall forgive him. Notice what James says, James 4.1. Where do wars and fights come from among you? Do they not come from your desires for pleasure that war in your members? Matthew 7.3. And why do you look at the speck in your brother's eye, but do not consider the plank in our own eye? That's what Messiah said. So there's, there's self-evaluation. How many of you know sometimes you hate the most what you see in yourself and someone else? Did I say that right? You got the picture. Yeah. You look at somebody else and you see a certain behavior, you recognize that behavior in yourself, and that's the behavior you can't stand to be around. It's true. And we need to understand that about ourselves. Now, I want, uh, this is where we're going to really get into what this is about. After speaking in Matthew 7, 3, Yeshua then went on to teach about what to do with a person who is totally rebellious and who is not interested in repentance or correction. And that has happened even in this body, that has happened. And guess what? It's going to happen again. Now, I'm not asking for it to happen. I'm not <laughs> wanting for it to happen. But I'm just saying human nature tells me it's going to happen again. If the first century congregations and fellowships had to deal with this time and time again, human nature tells us we're going to be dealing with it again and again. 
that brother is to go before the body of believers and is sent outside the camp until he is able to receive correction. Now, let me read the words of Messiah, okay? Because I think it's better to read what he said himself and not put words in his mouth. Moreover, if your brother sins against you, go and tell him his fault between you and him alone. That does not mean go tell sister doodad and brother hoo-ha, do you know what they did? I'm so offended. Do you know what she said? I'm so mad. No. Zip it. Nobody else needs to know. This is what Messiah's telling us to do. This is Torah. This is a living Torah. And then he says, go and tell him his fault between you and him alone. Not get on the internet or the phone and call in everybody. And <laughs> you and him alone means what in Hebrew? You and him alone. Nobody else involved, right? If he hears you, you have gained your brother. But if he will not hear, next step, step two. Take with you one or two more that by the mouth of two or three witnesses every word may be established. So you've gone by yourself to try to correct the situation. And he tells you pound sand, right? Biblically speaking, a lot of sand rocks out there. You know. Now, you take another person or two people with you, so there's at least two witnesses, right? And you go through the same process again. You know, whatever the sin was against you, you know, you, you lay it bare there. And if he refuses to hear them, tell it to the church or the congregation. Okay, but... If he refuses even to hear the church, notice what he says here. Now, this is Messiah. This is not Deborah saying this. He says, let him be to you like a heathen and a tax collector. There were never two more shunned people in all of Israel than a, than a heathen or a Gentile or a goy and a tax collector. It was like, right? Right? have nothing to do with. Okay, now, here's the funny thing about this. This is so foreign to the body of Christ that we don't even recognize it today, that that's the way you do things. Because when we had to do it here before, people thought, why are you doing this? Because it's Torah? Not because we, you know... The elders here, I mean, these are the best group of people I've ever worked with in my entire life. And nobody's mean. Everybody's nurturing, loving, and forgiving. But there are standards that we are required in Torah to live by. Today, many congregations tolerate people, and I know I've come from them, who have contaminated hearts and lifestyle. And in the times we're living in right now, a growing number of pastors have given in to a more politically correct model of handling sin through a non-biblical type of grace called compromise. Now, I'm going to say this again and again because I underlined it, I put it in bold, but I don't want you to forget it. Grace without responsibility coddles sin. I'm going to say it again. Grace without any kind of responsibility or accountability, all it does is coddle sin. You know what does coddle mean? Oh, poor baby. Oh, it's okay. You can be the biggest jerk in the whole wide world. Hurt people all over the place, but we love you. No. Would you do that with your own children? You know, if your children are slandering 
their brother or their sister, and you go, oh, that's okay, honey. Just keep on talking about them. Keep on spreading that hate. Oh, yeah, your brother hates you now. That's good. But we love you. It's the stupidest thing. We would never do that in our own families, but yet in the church somehow we think that's showing love. It's not showing love. If we did it the correct way, people would repent. If you put people outside the camp and everybody shunning them like a tax collector, and they, they would soon realize, oh my gosh, I, this is wrong. Something is wrong. And bring them to repentance. It's not meant to be mean. It's meant to bring people to repentance. But here's what happens, because I've seen it happen. Instead of following the Torah in the direction of the Torah, when someone's placed outside the camp, somebody will go running over, are you okay? We love you. Are you okay? And then they spew their stuff all over you again. And now you're defiled because you've listened to it. Do do you guys understand what I'm saying? And the only reason this isn't happening right now to my knowledge, so I'm not, you know, trying to address any kind of thing, but I know it's going to happen because of the nature of man, right? We're told that. Shouldering the, the sinner contaminates the entire congregation. I, I'm telling you, it is like a cancer. True leadership will always apply Yahweh's kingdom principles or instruction to rid contamination in the camp. This is where true grace is found. Only through obedience will holiness come into the lives of Yahweh's people. And why am I saying this in such a strong manner? It's because I know there will be, there'll be a situation to deal with at some time in the future, and you have to make up your mind right now how you're going to handle it. Because we don't look at it that way. Well, we look at it like, well, they didn't do anything to me. Well, guess what? We just read in Numbers that they did it to Yahweh. And Yeshua said, what you have done to the least of these, my brothers, you have done to me, good or bad. Same principle would apply. So even though somebody hasn't done something to you, they have done it to Yahweh because Yahweh is in you. The Spirit The Ruach lives in you and this person and that person. And if somebody is set out the camp, there's a reason for it. And if you don't trust leadership, then you don't, you need, you need to go find a place where you trust leadership in those kind of areas. Because in this body, we deal with stuff. Why? Because we love all of the people here. And we don't want anyone to become defiled. These are the hardest situations to deal with. I pray that yeah, I pray Yeshua returns before we have to deal with it again. But I know it's probably um, it's a pipe dream. <laughs> but I'm yes yeah, a good one. <laughs> yeah. It's a great pipe dream. Can I live there for just a little while? Okay, so now we're going to move on to cleaning the camp, the law of jealousy. This is what you're going to love. Not that you didn't love the last thing we went through, did you? Did you love it? Oh, yeah. Are you still excited about Torah? Yeah. You know why? Because if we live in a clean camp, we live in a safe camp. Right? It's so important. The law of jealousy is a picture of Yeshua's bride, us, who has been unfaithful to him. And we have all been unfaithful. We have had our years of idolatry and living any way we wanted to and having no boundaries. These laws express the process Yeshua went through for our redemption. 
This is in Numbers 11 through 31. So if you want to go back and study this, it's important. Because when he stood on our behalf before our accuser, many of us really didn't fully realize, myself included, that Yeshua had to fulfill Numbers 5 in order to redeem us. And we're going to go into that just a little bit. When believers understand this law, it sets precedence in our hearts and believers become more attentive to their lifestyle choices. I believe this with my whole heart or I wouldn't have written it. It's important for us to understand what Yeshua did for us. Now I'm going to just kind of give an overview and then we'll read the scripture on what, what this means. If a husband knew or suspected his wife of being unfaithful, she was considered impure, and he brought her to the tabernacle to stand before the priest with an offering of a tenth of ephah, which is an omer, Interesting, we're counting the Omer right now, right? 42! Yes, let's do it out loud. 42! 42! So we're going to, yeah. And are you in expectation of the Spirit of God doing amazing things at Shavuot? I am. (laughs) Yeah, he is. So a tenth of an ephah of barley flour, a coarse-textured spring grain on her behalf, no oil or incense, incense, incest, in, no incest either, was uh, <laughs> placed on this offering as it was the grain offering for jealousy, a reminder offering to draw attention to guilt. The priest had the woman stand alone before Yahweh, which is what we're all going to do someday as his bride. We're going to stand alone before him. He took holy water, water of cleansing, in a clay jar and put some of the dust of the tabernacle floor into the water. He loosened her hair and placed in her hands the offering while he held the bitter water that brings a curse. The priest put the woman under oath. If she was innocent and had not gone astray, the bitter water would bless her. But if she had committed adultery, the bitter water would cause her abdomen to swell and her thigh, which represents her lineage or generations to come, to waste away. The woman would answer, Amen and Amen, meaning so be it, so be it. In other words, bring on the test, bring on the test. Right? Do you know, according to some of the commentaries and writings that I've read, that uh, no woman ever had to go through this real procedure? And I can see why. If I knew I was going to go there and if I was guilty, I would be throwing myself and repenting all over the place before I drank that. Right? So, really, it was kind of there also as a protection. I'm, I'm, just real quickly before I go into the real meat of this, it protected the woman and the man. And here's why. Because if he had a spirit of jealousy and it was unfounded, it would have ruined their relationship. Right? And if it was founded and she was living this kind of a lifestyle, it would ruin their relationship. So it was really a protection for their relationship to remain intact. See, the Torah was never meant to bring death. It was to release us and set us free from the laws of sin and death. Whether it was in relationships, because this relationship would die if he had offense in his heart towards her, and it was unfounded. But think of how he's going to feel now. He's brought her up there before the priest, and she goes, so be it, bring the test on, I'm ready, I'm ready to drink this stuff. 
and he's going to feel like the biggest jerk in the world. She's going to get flowers every day for a couple of years, candy. He's going to go to seas. He's going to do all this stuff, right? Just kidding. Okay, got to have fun with this. Everybody's looking way too serious. <laughs> the priest then wrote the curses on a scroll. Now, this is, to me, this was something I never knew. I just never it passed me by before. The priest then wrote the curses on a scroll and sponged the ink off with a small amount of vinegar, according to Hebrew thought, and put this into a clay vessel filled with water. The priest took from her hand a handful of grain as the memorial offering to be burned on the altar and had the woman drink the bitter water. If she was defiled and had been unfaithful to her husband, the drink would cause bitter suffering. Her abdomen would swell, her thigh would waste away. Sounds like not a party to me. Um, If she had not defiled herself, she would be cleared of guilt and impurity and restored as a virtuous woman able to conceive children, to be fruitful. Now watch this. This applies to Yeshua, and we're getting ready to see the application here. In John 8, 1 through 11, while Yeshua was teaching in the temple court, some teachers and Pharisees decided to test him to see if he would speak against the law of Moses and the law regarding adultery. They were always trying to make him look like a lawbreaker, and he never was, ever. And you're going to see this here. So they approached Yeshua saying, Teacher, this woman was caught in the act of adultery. The law of Moses commanded us to stone such women. Now, what do you say? Interesting to note that Yeshua did not respond to them. You back that up. that the teachers only brought the woman and not the man before Yeshua. Upon seeing this, he refused to even address them. Do you remember? He's just looking down. He doesn't talk to them. Yeshua bent down and started to write in the dirt of the temple floor with his finger. Leviticus 20.10 says, The the man who commits adultery with another man's wife, he who commits adultery with his neighbor's wife, the adulterer and the adulteress shall surely be put to death. So while they're trying to make sure the woman gets stoned, they didn't bring the guy in. Now, they didn't realize they're talking to the living Torah, the one who wrote the book. He knew it. He knew everything about it. Now watch this. Why didn't Yeshua seem to respond to them? What sins of dishonor will take us outside the camp of Yahweh? There's three things that rendered a person unclean, leaving them outside the camp. Touching a dead body, sexual immorality, and zarat infection, which... Sarat is that which contaminated the body by discharge, either verbally or otherwise, gossip, assumption, slander, and murmuring, or Lashon Hara. Lashon Hara means the evil tongue, or forms of dishonor that that caused the Zarat infection. Chris just did a recent teaching on that, and one of the Torah section was amazing, it was great. Um, This law applied not only for the one speaking, but also to the listener. Both were rendered unclean and found guilty as out of the mouth of two or three witnesses it is established. In John 8, that passage, forgot to put in that passage there, but Yeshua fulfilled the law not by listening to their Lashon Hara against this woman or passing judgment on her because they didn't have the guy there. 
So as far as he was concerned, at this point it's gossip, and he's not even listening to him, right? Writing in the dirt of the temple floor with his finger was a Hebrew metaphor for the authority of Yahweh. In this one act, Yeshua revealed himself as the word made flesh and portrayed himself as the authority of Yahweh, the Messiah. The author and writer of the very law they were accusing this woman of. Could Yeshua have been writing the curse from Numbers 5, the law of jealousy for the woman caught in adultery intended for the incriminating to see? Or was he writing their sins? Did he write Numbers 5? You know, they didn't go by numbers in, I guess he would have had to have written something else. He would have had to have written the scripture itself, right? I just happened to remember they, don't have, they didn't have verses and things there. But anyway, whatever he was writing, they got the picture, right? Because one by one, they left. And he said, He who is without sin among you, let him throw a stone at her first. He exposed the teachers of the law for using his instructions incorrectly. They had handled the word of God as a striking rod on the sheep rather than using it to guide and to help. They were using it for condemnation without the authority of the Torah that explained the procedures on how to handle the situation. These leaders were propagating a religious spirit of judgment than rather a heart after the spirit. Who really was the adulterer here? The woman or the religious leaders? They were doing it their own way. They were defiling the word of God by their actions. They were gossiping. Believers, we are all going to stand before Yeshua one day. And we will have blessed people by teaching them how to walk in the life applications of Torah, or have we beaten them with a religious spirit and our knowledge causing them to turn away because we have not respected or honored them? In the essence of... In essence, a religious spirit curses Yeshua's people in the name of Torah. We have to be careful with our words with people and make sure that we are building them up and not tearing them down. Make sure that we're not gossiping. Now notice the word dirt in the scriptures can represent people. Because we all came from what? Dirt. And whatever Yeshua was writing on the ground that day was taking precedence over people. I believe it was a verse of Torah that he wrote. Just like he takes his finger now, and even this day to day, he's writing Torah on our hearts. Do you feel like he is? I do, for sure. To condemn the woman without revealing the truth of the word to her would be to put her and her future generations into enslavement and spiritual lack. This was the incorrect interpretation of the truth that Yeshua uncovered, as his truth is always designed to set the captives free from the law of sin and death. That is the goal of Torah. That is the goal of Messiah. Even though Yeshua did not speak out loud, those who heard him began leaving, from the eldest down to the youngest, until only Yeshua was left standing alone with the woman. And then Yeshua straightened up and asked her, Woman, Where are they? Has no one condemned you? No, sir, she said. Because remember, it requires two or more witnesses before a fact can be established. 
they had no witnesses that were worthy witnesses. In other words, without sin themselves, they had no way to um, extrapolate some kind of blessing from it. They were, you know, that a, a reliable witness is one who has no uh, skin in the game, so to speak, right? And that's not the case here. And she said, no one, sir, then neither do I condemn you. Go now and leave your life of sin. Now, this is the beauty of Torah right here. Early on the day before the Feast of Unleavened Bread, on which the Passover lamb was to be sacrificed, Yeshua's disciples joined him for the Passover Seder meal. After taking the cup, he gave thanks and said, Take this and divide it among you. For I tell you, I will not drink again of the fruit of the vine until the kingdom of God comes. And he took bread and gave thanks and broke it. And he gave it to them, saying, This is my body given to you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after the supper, he took the cup and saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood which is poured out for you. Before I get into to this next portion here, um, he actually, by saying that he would not drink of the vine until he comes and drinks it anew with us in the kingdom, he was actually taking a Nazarite vow to abstain from alcohol until that day, which is it's amazing. The Hebrew word for new, as in the new covenant in his blood, kainos means meaning renewed, not as we think in English, as something entirely brand new. For example, the word new in new moon each month is also kanos, meaning renewed, not a brand new creation. Hence, a proper rendering of the text is, this cup is the renewed covenant in my blood, which is poured out for you. Then when he... Then, then when they leave later and, and they go to the Garden of Gethsemane, right, the next day, and he's there and he's praying this, Father, if you are willing, take this cup from me, yet ne- not my will but yours be done. Which cup was Yeshua talking about when he prayed on the Mount of Olives? Was it the cup from the Passover Seder meal? Nope. This cup Yeshua was praying praying about in the Garden of Gethsemane was the cup he was about to drink on our behalf, on the behalf of his bride. In John 19, 28 through 30, later knowing that all was now completed and so that the scripture would be fulfilled, Yeshua said, I am thirsty. A jar of wine vinegar was there. So they soaked a sponge in it, put the sponge on a stalk of the hyssop plant, and lifted it to Yeshua's lips. When he had received the drink, Yeshua said, it is finished. And with that, he bowed his head and gave up his spirit. He drank the bitter cup of the adulterous bride for us. Just think about that for a minute. And the hyssop plant, as interesting as what the priest used to take the blood of the Passover lamb and sprinkle it. It was the hyssop plant that covered, they used to dip the blood in the lamb and cover the doorposts for their salvation when they left Egypt. There is not one thing in Torah or in the word of God that doesn't have purpose and meaning. To me, this is the most beautiful portion The cup was for the suspected adulterous bride in the law of jealousy from Numbers 5. 
Believers in Yeshua are the adulterous wayward bride. One day we will all stand before the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob and be served this cup on our wedding day, Yom Kippur. When we drink, we will say amen and amen. Bring on the test. Bring on the test. It is Yeshua who has taken upon himself our sin, the sin of the adulterous bride, and he himself drank our cup. And when we stand before him that day, we will be found virtuous in him. Is that amazing? Is that amazing? I love his word so much. Doesn't it draw you to him and make you realize what an awesome, amazing God we serve? Sometimes it's, almost too much. The Hebrew meaning behind the words it is finished originates from the same root word, kala, as bride, one who makes complete or perfect. It's all you women out there. If you're a bride, you have made somebody complete or perfect. That's what the real meaning of bride is. Shalom is an additional Hebrew word for finish, according to Strong 79.9. As Yeshua cried out in his death, it is finished, he cried for his bride to repent, to make a complete, ret- to make a complete return to him through his provision, and to enter into his shalom called the eternal Sabbath rest. In essence, Yeshua was crying out, Shalom, my bride. The beautiful way to look at it. To know that he loves us so much. Yeshua fulfilled the law of jealousy in Numbers 5. As we stated earlier, a priest wrote the curses on a scroll, then sponged the ink off with a small amount of vinegar and put them in an earthen vessel filled with water. Yeshua is the living Torah scroll and the living water. He drank the cup and is the living clay vessel. The priest then took the grain offering from the suspected adulterous bride as a memorial and burned it. Yeshua took our sin upon himself, becoming the grain offering of remembrance, and at the same time took our guilt and died our death. I'm getting ready to close here. Revelation 19, the wedding of the Lamb has come, and his bride has made herself ready. Fine linen, bright and clean, was given her to wear. Fine linen stands for the righteous acts of the saints, obeying the teaching and instruction, the word Torah of Yahweh, a.k.a., also known as priestly garments. That's what white linen is. And I'm going to close with this verse. Now I saw heaven opened, and behold, a white horse. And he who sat on him was, ju- was called faithful and true. And in righteousness he judges and makes war. His eyes were like a flame of fire, and on his head were many crowns. He had a name written that no one knew except himself. He was clothed with a robe dipped in blood. And in his name is called the Word of God, the Living Torah. And armies in heaven clothed in fine linen, white and clean, followed him on white horses. Now out of his mouth goes a sharp sword, that with it he should strike the nations, and he himself will rule them with a rod of iron. He himself treads the winepress of the fierceness and the wrath of Almighty God. And he has on his robe and on his thighs a name written, King of kings and Lord of lords. Our bridegroom. And that's what this is all about. Even today's Torah portion is we're preparing ourselves to be the bride. 
Will we follow his instructions? Or will we allow ourselves to become defiled by doing things our own way? Because the bride of Messiah cares about being defiled, cares about bringing honor to her husband, cares about doing things the way God would have us do them. Do we fall sometimes? Yes. And that's what his blood-soaked robe was for to cover us if we repent. Repentance is key. It's not this loosey woosey, gracey, greasy, gracey, whatever you want to call it. It's grace with accountability. Amen? Amen. Well, I'm just sorry to have cheered you right down, <laughs> but I, I am so in awe. And I hope you are too, of, of Yahweh, of Yeshua. And every step of Torah was written for our instruction and for our benefit. Amen? Amen.